start, guys. Uh, so last class, thanks for coming. Uh, I know everybody's busy with the finals, etc. So this this will be uh, this class will be short, and uh, I hope not. Uh, I hope pretty enjoyable uh, to uh, to do it. Um, so so you know mechanism. Uh, so makes the mechanism clear. So like like we said in reduced form, we also need theory. But we just don't make it so explicit most of the time. Right? So we re rely on theory to establish identification in reduced form. Uh, but however, we don't actually spell them out very clearly in many empirical uh, research. So structural force you to explicitly model the mechanism, which may be a good thing. Right? Um, <clears throat> now, also, a structural, a structural, structural estimation allows us uh, to, um, to identify uh, unobserved variables, like deep variables, that cannot be identified using reduced form, like the cost of a company. Right? Um, okay. Now, uh, using structural models, uh, we can potentially do kind of factual simulation. Uh, in particular, what this means is that uh, if we, if our data come from one distribution, okay, um, and we can potentially use this distribution, learn from distribution, to predict what happens in another complete different kind of distribution, okay? So, um, right, so structural data, because it models a mechanism, as long as two different distributions share very similar mechanisms, we can learn the mechanism from one distribution and use it to predict what happens or use it to model another distribution. So this, this is sort of the power of structural estimation. Because in reduced form estimation or in any statistical estimation, okay, any statistical learning prediction, uh, your, your model is trained on one kind of population or distribution. And you can only use it to predict what happens if you observe samples drawn from the same population. If the samples are drawn from a different kind of population, if it's quite different, then your prediction will be very bad. Right? So those st statistical learning all have this major limitation to them. Structural model, because it models the, because it estimates the underlying mechanism, you can potentially use, you know, learn things from one kind of distribution and use it to predict something in a completely different distribution. So an example will be, um, the, uh, or in other words, uh, what we can learn from one observed phenomena can be used to explain and predict other related phenomena right, using structural estimation. Right? So one example would be, uh, suppose uh, we see in individuals uh, career choices. Okay? So we see a person uh, choosing this career over that career, for example. Now, observing individual choice over career can probably can tell us something about their risk aversion. Because uh, some career choices have well, you know, maybe high reward, high risk. Other, other things may be low reward or low risk. And, uh, and you see person, a person choosing one over another, that says that's something about the person's risk aversion. If we use a structural model to learn this person's risk aversion, maybe okay, if our model is good enough, then we can use the estimated risk aversion to help predict that person's investment behavior. Okay. If the person has money and they invest in a different kind of assets, how would that person, or that person is an investment manager, how would that person do, how would that person invest? The investment decision is also, is also governed by the same kind of risk aversion that also revealed it themselves in this person's career choices, for example, right? So you can potentially learn from one data, one kind of data, and use it to predict other kind of related phenomena if you estimate the underlying causal mechanism, but uh, using structural model. If you don't, if you use reduced form, it'd be very hard to do things like this, right, okay? So this will be the power of uh, structural models. Right. Um, now, the, the power to do counterfactual simulation is also due to the fact that the structural model learns so-called invariant or deep parameters. This is a key to structural estimation. If you talk to structural guys, they often say, what well, you know, well, characterize structural estimation is this ability to learn deep parameters or invariant parameters. And what, the, what they mean by invariant that if I take, if I learn this model from one kind of environment, and I use the model to predict what happens in another kind of environment, say for example in a counterfactual uh, scenario, uh, the, the ability to do so is based on the ability to estimate parameters that do not change when you change the environment. So parameters that do not change when you change the environment is called invariant or deep parameters. Now take the take the monopoly example. Right? In the monopoly example. What is invariant, underlying invariant, is the, is the company cost. So I can have a tax, or you know, the government can put a tax on it, or the government can put no tax on it, right? So in a no tax environment, or a tax environment, they are completely different environments with different distribution of P and Q, 
but the underlying C is not changing. That's an invariant parameter. So if we can estimate that invariant parameter, then we can use the estimate structure model to predict what happens in a completely different environment when there's taxation. Uh, take the auction example. Uh, the value, right, how people value the, the object being auctioned is an invariant deep parameter. So if we learn it, then we can use this invariant parameter to predict what would happen if we change, for example, if we change the auction format. If we change it from first price to second price, for example, what would happen? We will be able to do that because the V is not changing, right? Uh, again, in reduced form or in any statistical modeling, it's hard to do that because we're not learning such kind of invariant parameters. So we're just modeling the joint distribution in one population, and it's very hard to extrapolate to another population. Right? So this is so the uh, the external validity of structural estimation come from the the underlying you know reason why structural estimation could have more external validity is because the causal mechanism that we estimate has more stability and it can be transportable from one environment to the other, right? And, be, and because it has stability, it has these invariant parameters that we can estimate. So that's the uh, idea. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, now, uh, in in applied economic research, uh, I talk about many uh, many forms of research in applied microeconometrics. It's essentially program evaluation, uh, right? So you see a lot of research. Uh, the goal of the research is to evaluate the cause and effect of a government program or any policy, etc. Right? So we say, okay, you know, if uh, if the Chinese government builds a a highway, what is the you know, what is the effect on economic development and stuff like that. Okay, so these are policy evaluation. So if our goal is policy evaluation, then um, depends on what kind of effect we are trying to uh, get. Okay, so if we are there are three kind of different uh, policy evaluation problems we can do. The first kind of policy evaluation pro uh, problem is evaluating the impact of historical program on outcome. So you know something that's already been done, right? Uh, so, for example, the Chinese government has already built, uh, you know, the high, you know, the, the speed rail uh, system, for example, and you want to know whether the already built system has any co has any causal effect on the local GDP, right, on the local economic development. If you want to know that, then this is this is sort of like a you're trying to estimate an effect, a historical effect that has already happened, right? Now, so this is more of a problem with internal validity in the sense that you're looking at the data. And you try to get the causal effect out of that population only. So for that kind of problem, you can do this form, you can do structural, or no problem. Okay. Now the second kind of problem is forecasting in the future, forecasting the impacts of programs in, in implementing in one environment, uh, and you want to forecast its impact in another environment. So uh, so you know so for example, you see the Chinese government builds a high speed rail system, you see that it's impact on you know there's GDP growth, etc. And you want to predict what will happen if, uh, for example, another country, right? So, for example, Thailand or maybe the United States build a similar high-speed rail system across the country. What will be the contribution to GDP? So you want to you want to have one system. You know, you see a program in one environment. You want to predict the the effect of program in another environment. So now these things get a little bit tricky if you do it this form because the causal effect, the internal causal effect in one environment may not hold. In another environment, for reasons that I have already talked about in my lecture, right? There are two main reasons why uh, causal effects may not be transportable. One reason is that the, the underlying mechanism may already change. The other reason is the underlying mechanism is the same, but the distribution of the causal effects modifiers are different. So, for these reasons, the causal effect may not transport, right? Um, the third kind of uh, uh, some causal effect, uh, the, the third kind of program evaluation program. A problem is forecasting the impact of program never historically experienced. Okay, so this is similar to the uh, monolo monopoly example we gave, where there's no tax and suddenly there's a new tax in one of the effect. So for P2 and P3, right, the, the second kind of problem and third kind of problem, oftentimes uh, we oftentimes they require the use of structural model that, that estimates an invariant mechanism. Okay, so if you do if you don't have that because the environment already changes. Or because the program has never been implemented before, reduced form will be pretty limited in its ability to do P2 and P3, especially P3. Right? P3, the counterfactual kind of simulation can only be done typically using structural estimation. Uh, if you want to do reduced form for P2, then you typically have to argue uh, in a convincing way that the causal effect in one environment actually is transportable to another environment. Right? Okay. 
um, for all these three, for all three kind of for all three kind of problems, if you ever want to do welfare impact, okay, so if, if you ever want to do welfare analysis, so you analyze the welfare impact of this program, you have to do structure because welfare is inherently a theoretical construct. So if you don't use a theoretical model, there's no way to estimate. There's typically no way to uh, to analyze welfare impact. Okay, and. Uh, Okay, so here's a uh, the here's an interesting quote by Hackman and Grelasio. Uh, the uh, I put in a, in a footnote, but I actually like this uh, this quite a lot. So they're 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 pretty uh, they're critiquing the uh, the R they're mainly critiquing the RCM, uh, but you can think about it as a, as a critique of um, of uh, many you know general approach in reduced form, which is uh, they say you know remember that uh, we introduced the RCM the, the Rubin causal model. Where uh, the the causal effect is is so we conceptualize as y zero and y one, right? So zero one is the treatment, um, right? So the Rubin causal model says uh, there's potentially there's a counterfactual outcome y zero and a counterfactual outcome y one, and uh, and you know if you uh, if if x the treatment is exogenous, uh, then then the uh, then essentially we have y zero will just be equal to e y x equal to zero, but if it's endogenous, then we don't have this relation, right, et cetera. So this is the, the RCM framework. Um, and uh, and Hackman is a, a structural guy. Right? So he's, he thinks that, uh, he believes that in order to uh, estimate the causal effect of treatment, uh, we need to think very clearly about the mechanism, actually model that mechanism. So, so here, if we use the RCM kind of thinking, you're always thinking about how to make the treatment sort of exogenous by controlling stuff or by you know using other ways to make the treatment sort of you know randomly assigned. Because if it's randomly assigned, then we can do this. But uh, we're, you're not really you're not really trying to model uh, the uh, the underlying mechanism why people choose zero versus why people choose one in reality, right? Because in economics, everything is is a person's choice, not assignment in a, in experiment. So this is what Hagman says, right? He says, uh, and Vilasso says, so the incorporating choice into the analysis of treatment effects is an essential and, a, and a distinctive ingredient of economic approach. Uh, an assignment in the RCM model is an assignment to treatment, not an assignment of incentives and an eligibility for treatment with the agent making the treatment choice themselves. So what he's saying here is uh, using the RCM kind of framework to think about uh, causal inference. Uh, which, uh, and by the way, econometrics, um, for people like, uh, there are people uh, who, advocate, who sort of uh, advocate a kind of approach, uh, reduced home approach, called quasi-experimental methods. Um, you know, if you have taken econometrics, you probably have heard of that terms. But the idea of quasi-experimental methods is try to find in the data a uh, random variation in the treatment acts, right? So x is a, so in economic data, x is a treatment is typically the outcome of choice. But, you know, for example, like schooling, right? I'm going to say education, schooling. But if, uh, but if there is some part of X that is almost random, let's take that and try to use that to do causal inference. That's, uh, that's the basic idea behind quasi-experimental. Uh, for people who have heard about, you know, at the beginning of this course, uh, I think some people have asked about uh, regression discontinuity, right? Now, the idea of regression discontinuity is, you know, there's education, there's education, Okay, and there's earning, uh, okay, wage, and uh, and maybe, okay, maybe just maybe in a in a very tiny neighborhood, uh, say for example, this is the this is the cutoff for Gaokao, right? Okay, so so Gaokao cutoff. Now, for people who have very similar scores in Gaokao, people who are above the cutoff get seen, people who are out of the cutoff get goes out. They don't have you know they don't have the college. So the assignment of people to college is almost random, okay, almost random. It's not by it's not by choice. It's almost random in this small neighborhood. Now, if it is almost random, then let's use it, okay? Let's use this neighborhood to do causal inference because uh, the x now is almost random in this neighborhood. Then the com then the simple comparison of people get in and get out, uh, you know, basically tells you the causal basically tells you the causal effect of getting to college versus not getting to college, okay? Now the problem with 
first of all, the problem with this kind of approach is that even if you can do a very clean causal effect estimation, your causal effect typically is only confined to this very small interval, meaning you're only estimating the causal effect for people in this small range. For people here, for people here, your causal effect, there's no guarantee that your causal effect actually holds for people outside of this small range, okay? Because you're only finding a very small range in which it is almost random. Outside that, there's no guarantee. Now, in other words, if you, you, know, if you, if you do this kind of study for, uh, for causal effect for college, you're comparing people who are just above the Kalkal Kalkal line versus people who are just below the Kalkal line. Now, what you're really getting is the, is the treatment of a college on these people, like on people whose, whose score is right around the Kalkal line, okay? For people who are way above the Kalkal line, right? So people who go to, you know, uh, this university or, you know, or other universities, it doesn't apply, okay? It, it probably, most likely, it doesn't apply. And so this is the limitation. But, uh, but Hackman and Velasco were, were talking about a deeper point, which is uh, this kind of approach to not force the econometrician, to not force the economist to think very clearly about the mechanism. The mechanism of why, like where does the treatment effect of college come from? And how do people actually choose college versus non-college, right? How do people actually make the choice? Because uh, here the, the, the goal is trying to just trying to find randomness in a data. And if you're, if you're thinking too much on trying to find randomness in a non-random data, you are not, you are basically throwing away all kinds of data. So data here and data here, you're throwing them away. But data here and data here are non-random, right? The x is non-randomness sign, but you are not using them. You're only using the random part. And in doing so, you'll throw away a lot of information because the non-random part actually tells you a lot about individual's preference as well. Why? Because you, if you see, because the non-random part is the, the x in the non-random part is the result of people making choice. Now, if you really think about how people are making choice, then their choice reveal their preference. People's choice reveal their preference. People's choice reveal their incentives. Right? And so if you really, if you, if you have a method to extract, okay, to estimate people's preference from their choice, then you can get results from these data in addition to this data. So your estimation will be better. Okay? Your causal inference will be better. So in other words, um, it, it'd be better if we can clearly try to model the underlying preference and incentives and try to get them out of the people's choice rather than throwing them away and only focus on the so-called random part. Uh, so that's what they're saying. Uh, and it happens to be, uh, so, so they link this with the RCM framework. Because the RCM framework also stress the idea, that the RCM framework also stress the, the sort of the, the virtue of random assignment. So if, you know, if it's random assignment, we can get a causal effect. If it's not random assignment, we cannot get a causal effect. Right? So that's, that's the RCM idea. So they're criticizing that, right? They're saying, it's better for us to think about a choice as an assignment of incentives and eligibility and, and actually estimating them rather than, rather than thinking about just as a, you know, just assignment to treatment, okay? Uh, so you can read the rest. It's, a, it's an interesting critique. All right, and finally, uh, you know, if a structural model is doing, if a structural model does well, then we can potentially deliver better predictive performance. So even if we only care about prediction, because there are some, there are some uh, misconceptions about uh, structural model in, in, in empirical people, right? Some people think that structural estimation is, is, now useful, is now used for predictive accuracy. Some people think reduced form or statistical model give you better predictive performance. Structural model is used, not used for prediction purposes. It's mainly used to estimating the mechanism. Well, that's actually not the correct way to think about it. Because if the structural model is really good, it can potentially deliver better predictive performance than reduced form. Why well, think about a quintessential structure model, not in economics, but in natural science, right? So natural science, physics, every theory, quantum mechanics, these things are structure models. And they are much, much better than any statistical model you can do when it comes to predicting over a wider range of phenomena. And the reason why is, part of the reason why, is because the structural models uh, can learn from all kinds of data. So just like I said, you can learn from people's risk aversion, from investment behavior, from career choice, from all kinds of data. So potentially, if your model is really good, then the model parameter can be extremely finely estimated because you have all kinds of wide range of data to continually to fine tune and learn the model parameter, right? Just like the gravitational constant, for example. Okay, you all kinds of data to estimate the gravitational constant, and you can estimate to be very, very precise. The problem is in economics, we don't have very good models. And that's really the problem. Once you don't have very good models, then all these kind of things moot, right? 
So that brings us to uh, sort of the, the drawbacks of structural estimation. Like I said last time, if you don't have good models, then it's crap in and crap out. So in the sense that your structural model will deliver actually the worst result than using a you know using a statistical model uh, in a reduced form way. Okay. Uh, so this is continue going to be a battle in economics because no uh, people are still going you know arguing with each other about what is the best approach to do applied economic research. Right. Uh, so if you're interested uh, in the uh, on my yes, as you have guessed it, there is a challenge. And the assignments for um, okay, so causal inference challenge one, challenge two, I believe. Also, there's a challenge for structural estimation. So, if you're interested, um, the homework for uh, for this called foundation causal inference includes some challenges that you can take a look. Where I I ask you to actually read the relevant literature where people fight about reduced home structural and and essentially summarize the fight for me, right? And and also tell me what you think about this challenge. Let me see. Uh, no, not this one. Uh, okay. Hold on. Let me just say which one. <clears throat> okay, so two challenges here. Uh, so this one is only one extra point. Uh, extra point, which is summarized this article by Tison and Carvite, which I personally I, I like it very much. Uh, if you are following, uh, you know. The Nobel Prize this year, right, won by uh, Duflo, and uh, so so the so so the Nobel Prize this year um, is goes to randomized, specially randomized field experiments. So the randomized field experiments, uh, what what they do is they use large scale field experiments to uncover the the keys to development, also poverty mitigation in different regions of the world, right. Um, now it happens that a couple years ago the Nobel Prize went to uh, Deaton, Andrew Deaton for Princeton, and uh, who strongly criticized many approaching the random field experiment people. Okay, so so this article is, is sort of like a sort of a critique of the Nobel Prize this year. You can think about it that way. Um, and one of the points that Deaton made in this article is that uh, people who do uh, people who do randomized Field experiments, randomized trials in field experiments, uh, oftentimes uh, use field experiments to estimate causal effects without without really without really uh, thinking clearly about the mechanism. So essentially, this is the same point I made in this lecture, which is even if even if you think you are doing random experiments and you think the uh, the, the causal estimate is valid, the va the validity, okay. Uh, the internal validity you have, but you do not know how external validity it is, in the sense that if you don't think clearly about mechanism, you don't even know what the estimate causal effects actually mean. So that's the point I made in my lecture. That's actually also the point that Deaton and Carvey made in their, in their paper, which says a lot of people who are doing random experiments, they don't think clearly about mechanism. And if they don't, then the, any results they estimate is kind of, you don't even know how to use it, and you don't know how to interpret it. Um, so Deaton himself would advocate a more structural approach uh, in development studies. Okay, so that's what this paper is about, and you can read these points. But the second challenge um, is a full extra point, which asks you to read a little bit more data papers, right? But these are the these are some papers in which uh, people are essentially, you know, arguing with each other about the validity about which approach is better: the reduced form approach or the structural approach. Uh, starting with uh, this quite famous paper now uh, by Andrews and Fischer on the uh, credibility revolution in empirical economics. Uh, so for people who have taken graduate classes and who have probably uh, studied the, uh, their book, because they have a very famous book in econometrics today, it's called The Most Harmless Econometrics. Right? So that book essentially advocates a very, uh, how to say, reduced form and a quite experimental approach to identify causal effects. And they, they basically also talk about that in their paper here. And of course, uh, there are a lot of other papers who are, who are probably you know, against, a little, bit, a little bit against their approach, or at least not such a big fan of their approach. Okay? Um, so I ask you to read all these uh, papers and uh, summarize the different viewpoints of both sides, uh, and also tell me what you think on, on this very contentious issue in uh, economic research. Okay? So that's really the structure, uh, sort of the challenge for, uh, for the foundation course. Okay, so I'm ready to uh, to go beyond this foundation uh, just a little bit, 
And, uh, and let's come back to Regis Hall. Okay. Uh, so talk enough about structural, let's come back to Regis Hall. Now, the Regis Hall approach, if it's, if it's uh, correctly done, consists of two stages. Uh, the one stage is to, uh, to think about identification, right? So causal reasoning is the first stage, where you can also think about this stage as the identification stage. That <coughs> The second stage is statistical estimation, right? The estimation stage, where we do statistical modeling. Statistical modeling. Now, I talk about these two stages in my foundation quite a lot, but we haven't really. Uh, so, in this, in today, I just want to show you some examples of how to do this in practice uh, using some simulation example I'm going to give. Okay. Now, in the first stage when we do causal reasoning identification, uh, the most widely used method is to, uh, is to try to do the back, is try to block all the backdoor criteria, or the backdoor path if you can. Because if you can control some variables to, to block all the backdoor path, then you just need to control for these variables and you're done, right? So that's the idea. Now the backdoor path, so let's think about it. Okay. So suppose there is a variable z, Suppose there's a variable z that satisfies the backdoor criteria. If z satisfies backdoor criteria, we know two things. First of all, e y given uh, do x z is just equal to e y given x z. Okay, so if z satisfies the backdoor criteria, we have that. Right. Now, if what we're interested in is uh, is e y given to x. Now you are given to x conditional on z, but you are given to x. If this is what you're interested in, it's very simple. It's just an integral of e y given do x z, and uh, and p z d z. Okay, just you know taking the expectation of that. Okay? So another way to write it, but but this one, but this is equal to this. Okay, so another way to write the third way to write it. Is is actually the expectation with back to z of e y x z. That's it. Okay. So this is a simple way to write this whole thing. Right. <clears throat> now, if there is a z that satisfies the backdoor criteria, then we can say that x in this case. So once con once we control for z, we can say that x become x, which is a treatment becomes ignorable or becomes exogenous to one. Right. Okay. Now, the backdoor criteria shows us that we do not need to observe and condition on all different, on all, all confounders. We just need to condition on the minimally sufficient set of variables that just block all the path. Okay. No need to condition on all the uh, confounders. Although, in most cases, it do not hurt. Right. Okay, so here's an example. Uh, suppose I have, I'm interested in the causal effect of A on Y. Uh, what variables do I need to control? Well, first of all, here is there is the, the confounder here is the W, because the W is the is the common cause, right? W goes to W is the cause of A, W is the cause of Y. However, uh, sometimes we <coughs> sorry, sometimes we do the backdoor criteria says we do not need to control for W. Uh, exactly, because you can also control for B. If you control for B, you also block the path. Okay, so it turns out that there are, there are multiple sets of variables you can control for: control for B, control for W, or control for V and W together. Right. Here's another example. Uh, you, you know, again, we're interested in A to Y. A to Y is what we're interested in, but uh, <coughs> but in that case, how many backdoor paths do we have? Open backdoor paths. We have A, Z, B, Y. So this is one open path. Uh, anything <coughs> open. We also have A, W, uh, Z. No, that, that was not open, right? So if A, W, Z, B, Y, this one is not open. And the reason why is because Z is a collider on this path. That is why it's a collider, it's not open. So the only open path is A, Z, B, Y. Okay, so 
what variable can we control according to the backdoor criteria? The criteria says, well, first of all, if we control for, G, for V, it's done, okay? Because this, oh, the only open path is blocked. So, okay, so we can control for V. But how about if I control for W? Well, if we control for W, it doesn't, this path is still open. But if I control for, um, oh, actually, should I, say, I, I should say this. How about control for Z? Because we have A, Z, V, Y. If I control for Z, that blocks this path. But if you control for Z, that opens another path. That opens the A, W, Z, V, Y path because you're conditioning on the collider. So what can we do? We can condition on Z and we can control for W. So Z, W will satisfy the backdoor criteria, right? Okay, so once we, because once we condition for Z, it blocks this path. But if we condition on W as well, then it blocks this path, which is opened by condition on Z. Okay, so that satisfies. Um, of course, I can also do Z and V. Now, once I condition on Z, again, it opens this path. But if I do V as well, it also blocks again. So, you know, I also can do Z, V, and finally, I can do Z, V, W. Right? So all these different sets of variables satisfy the backdoor criteria, which you can all control. Okay. All right. Uh, I will leave this to you. Okay. <laughs> so I'm not going over. But you know, in this example, there are multiple um, open backdoor paths, and you can think about what are the variables that would be sufficient to block all of them. Yeah. All right. What if you say, I don't really have, in most cases in critical applications, I don't really have such a detailed knowledge about the underlying mechanism. So you know, even if I wish, I cannot really. I cannot really draw or figure out such a, so my prior knowledge, right, so where do these things come from? Okay, where do cause inputs? These things come from your prior knowledge. But if you say, okay, my prior knowledge is not really that detailed, and I don't really know the exact mechanism that, that, you know, that's such a detailed mechanism linking everything. In that case, how do I, how do I choose variables to satisfy the backdoor criteria? Well, there's an easier way, and this easier criteria is called this destructive cause criteria, which says, you know, forget about the backdoor. Uh, just control for all observed causes of x and y. Just control. Control for every observed cause of x and every observed cause of y. You don't need to, you just need to know what causes x and what causes y. Okay? And control for all of them. No need to think about the detailed mechanism and what is what, you know, whether, whether it opens the path, whether it does not open the path, etc. Et just control for all the observed causes of x and the causes of y. And, and that's it. That's called the disjunctive cause criteria. Now, why? Because the idea is very simple. You can prove, very easily prove, that if you do this, then you will block all the backdoor path. If, if the, um, the variables that satisfy the backdoor criteria is observed. Okay? So in, in, other word, in other words, if there is a set of variable V that you can use to, um, sorry, if there is a Z, that satisfies backdoor criteria, then Z will be in this set of V. What is V? V is the, the union of the cause of X and the cause of Y. Okay? So if there is a Z that satisfies backdoor criteria, then Z will be in V. V is the union of the cause of X and Y. Observe. Okay, so that's that's the idea. It's very simple. So this destructive cause criteria uh, is a, you know is a useful criteria because it places less knowledge requirement on the underlying causal structure. You still need to know what causes X and what causes Y. And, uh, and then you probably, right, but at least you know that if there is a Z that can satisfy it, it's, in, it's either in, you know, it's basically in this union of the positive X and Y. So here's the example, right? Um, again, H or Y, right? Now, uh, suppose I'm assuming that uh, what, is the, uh, what are the observ observed variables? A, Y, <laughs> and B. So I, I assume that we observe all the variables, okay? The, the, dis, the disjunctive cause criteria will select V and W because V is the cause of A, W is the cause of Y. So the disjunctive cause, of, uh, cause criteria says we just select every cause of A and every cause of Y, okay, every cause of treatment and every cause of outcome. So the disjunctive cause criteria will select these two. Now, do these two satisfy the backdoor criteria? Yes. Okay? Because V, v satisfies, W satisfies, V, W also satisfies. So that satisfies the backdoor criteria, right? Here, um, again, I assume that I observe all the variables. Uh, so, what is the what is the what is the variable selected by this disjunctive criteria? The disjunctive cause criteria would select V, and would select W again. Okay, 
question, do they satisfy the Bechdel criteria? Well, what is the minimal, what is the minimally sufficient set of variable that satisfy the Bechdel criteria here? What is the minimal set? The minimal set is nothing. You don't need to control for anything because the M is a collider, so this path is already blocked. So you can just directly look at the correlation between A and Y. It tells you the causal effect. So the minimally sufficient set is a set that contains nothing. You don't need to control for anything. However, if you control for V and W, does, is it okay? Of course it's okay too, right? Of, of course it's okay. As long as don't don't control on that, you're done. You're, you're fine, right? So V and the W is selected by the disjunctive cost criteria. It is larger than the minimally sufficient set, but however, it still satisfies the factor, right? So that's. And let's, let's finally let's take a look at this. This, uh, this example. Well, actually, one more. Okay. Um, so in this example, we observe. What do we observe? We observe uh, a y, uh, uh, <laughs> sorry, m v w. So we observe these things, but we don't observe u one and u two, right? Okay. First of all, uh, what is the minimally sufficient uh, set uh, according to the backdoor criteria? Nothing, still nothing. We don't need to control for anything because, again, this is a collider, okay? You don't need to control for anything. What is the set, what is the set of variables selected by this destructive cost criteria? Well, the destructive cost criteria will select all the observed cause of treatment and outcome. So we select W and V again. Now, U1 and U2 are causes of treatment and outcome, mm -hmm. but we don't see them, so there's no way to select it, okay? So, the, the disjunctive cost criteria will select VW. The question is, is VW satisfy the backdoor criteria? Yes, because condition on them, you know, it does nothing, okay? It does nothing, so, but still it satisfies the backdoor criteria in the sense that there's no open backdoor, okay? So it still satisfies the backdoor criteria. And then finally, uh, here's the thing, now, uh, a, Y, now we see, we observe A, Y, V, and W, but we do, we do not observe U1 and U2. In this case, the disjunctive cost criteria would select V and W. Again, because, because the outcome of A, there's no, the, the only cause of A is U1, but we don't see it. The cause of Y that we see is W and V. So the disjunctive cost criteria would select W and V. Okay? Because that's the only cause of uh, you know, we observe. Question, do W and V satisfy the backdoor criteria? Here? Meaning, meaning, if we condition on W or condition on V, are we blocking all the backdoor path? Are we? We're not. Because if you condition on W, you open this path, right? So you open the path of A, U1, W, U2, and Y. So in this case, the disjunctive course criteria give you V and W, but they don't satisfy the backdoor criteria. So are we in trouble? Yes, we are, kind of, but, okay, but our theory, so our theorem still holds. The theorem is, if there is a Z that satisfies backdoor criteria, Z will be in this. But in this case, there is no Z that is observed that can satisfy the backdoor criteria, right? Because right now we only see A, Y, V, W, M. These are the only observed variables none of these variables can satisfy the backdoor criteria. There's no way. So in this case, there's no way to satisfy the backdoor criteria. Okay? You know, you, however you try, right? Because, you know, if you don't control for anything, there is this path. And can you, can, can you block it using V? No. Can you block it using M? No. You can block it using W, but then if you block it using W, it opens another path. And so there's no way to satisfy the backdoor criteria using the observed variables. So in this case, the disjunctive cost criteria also fails, right? Because there's nothing you can do. So in other words, in other words, if there is a way to block all the backdoor criteria, all the all the backdoor path using observed variables, then the disjunctive cost criteria would work. If there's no way to do that, then it then it wouldn't work. So this is very simple. That's why you can use the disjunctive cost criteria, because you know your because the, the theorem says. Uh, the idea is, if there is a way to do that, then it will be in the variable selected by. Okay. All right. <clears throat> uh, so that brings us to <clears throat> a, another challenge.
So this challenge is to uh, to read. Uh, do I require to read a paper? Uh, So this challenge is based on uh, the paper of Babylonia and Shona Jukov uh, in Hansen in 2014. It's called Inference on Treatment Effects After Selection Using High Dimensional Controls. And uh, the method that these authors propose is essentially a, essentially a disjunctive course criteria kind of thing, but applying lasso to it. All right? uh, so the method they do is, uh, there are two al the, the algorithm they propose is called the post-double selection method. Uh, the idea is there are a large number of z, so z is high dimensional. There are a large number of variables that uh, that, that you you are not sure uh, which one affects the treatment, which one affects the outcome. But I'm going to select the variables that that are related to the treatment, and and then we're going to select the variables that are related to the outcome, and then I'm going to combine them, and 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 using the combined set as control in the estimation of treatment effect. Okay, so 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 the idea is. Look, there's a high dimension of Z. There's a large set of Z. And uh, Z includes many things. X is the treatment, Y is the outcome. So the first step is to estimate these two. Y as a function of Z, and X as a function of Z. And then using lasso, because Z is potentially high dimensional, I'm going to use lasso to pick out the Z that are relevant to the outcome. And I'm going to use lasso to pick out the Z that are relevant to the X. And then I combine, you know, combine the two set of Z to form a single z hat z set, and I use this z set as a control in the estimation of causal effect of x on y. Okay, that's the idea. As you can see, um, this is essentially the the disjunctive cost criteria, because what they're doing is I'm I'm trying to pull out all the variables that cause x, and try to pull out all the variables that cause y, and I'm going to combine them, and uh, and I'm going to use it as a control to estimate the causal effect. But right? the spin here is really using a lasso to do sort of like a, the pick out thing, okay? Because because you may not really know which variable very clearly which variable that causes x, which variable that causes y. So let's use lasso to pick them out. Right? So that's that's the idea behind the approach. Um, I believe they have a they have written a package you can use directly. Yes. So there is an R package HTM where you can use directly uh, to implement their method. So you don't have to write the coding yourself. Although the code is pretty easy to write as well, right? So this challenge is about uh, doing that. All right. <clears throat> okay. Now let's assume. Uh, assume we, you know, let, let's assume that we actually have a set of Z that satisfy all the backdoor criteria. Then, uh, like I said, we can write this. We can write this equation, which is. So if there is a z that satisfies backdoor, then we say e y given dual x will be equivalent to uh, integrate with integral with respect to z uh, e y given x and z. Okay, right? So we can write it this way. Now, in particular, uh, let's say dual x equal to a. That that here would be x equal to a z, right? Now this is a, uh, you know, behind this e z is basically integrate integral with respect to p z. The question is how do we, so how do we do this in reality, in practice? Well, I can estimate this, right? So in order to, in order to estimate this thing, I can estimate this, okay? E y given <laughs> x a z. So how do I estimate this? Well, you can use a statistical model. Again, linear regression, for example. So a linear regression would be y equal to, uh, you know, this thing is equal to uh, to beta zero plus beta one x plus beta two z, right? Simple linear regression. You can use it to estimate this e, but you can also use more fancy, right? So more complicated linear models. But how do we do this? How do we do the inter? How do we do the expectation with respect to, with respect to z? Or in other words, how do we do the integral right, of p z d z? How do we do that? Well. In practice, what you can do is you can basically sum over all the available data points, okay? So i equal to 1 to n, and e hat, so this is your inside estimation, e hat y equal to, uh, actually let me just forget about the hat, right? 
I don't, you know, because we can write it this way, just EY given XI X equal to A, XI equal to A, and ZI equal to, uh, let's say, X equal to A, and Z equal to ZI, uh, and, okay, that's it. You can write it this way. All right. So what, uh, what I'm saying here, right, if, uh, is, uh, now, <clears throat> what this means is I can write it this way where it's basically I equal to 1 to N uh, F uh, A Z I where I define I define F X Z is equal to E Y given X Z okay? so if uh, if the expectation is this F you can always write it as a function of X Z and on each data point, let the z be let the z be equal to the z i on that point. But x is always equal to a, right? Because we're doing the causal effect, we're, we're conditional x equal to a. And, uh, and if you average all of them, that give you essentially that give you this. Now this is the idea of Monte Carlo integration. Okay. Okay. So I mentioned this several times. The idea of Monte Carlo integration is we we make this we calculate this integral, right? By essentially averaging on the observed data. That's it, okay? Right. I hope people remember. Uh, how do you how do you calculate EX numerically? If you have if you observe if you observe x1 to xn, how do you calculate EX? Right. EX is integral x px dx. How do you do that? Well summation 1 of n i equal to 1 to n x i, right? Okay. So essentially when you are trying to estimate the integral, you can replace it with an average on the training data, or I mean on the observed data. That gives you the expectation. That's the Monte Carlo integration. What we're doing here is exactly the same. Okay? So we can always write it this way. Okay. All right. <clears throat> so so uh, in other words, uh, if we can estimate this, if we can estimate EY given XZ, then we have the estimate of EY given 2X, right? Because EY given 2X is an average of EY given XZ. So if we have estimate of this, we have an estimate of the causal effect. Now with only one, with only one wrinkle here, right? Which is, uh, so far, what I've, been, I've, I've been calling this one causal effect. I said, okay, EY given 2x is causal, and EY given x, uh, conditional x is statistical, right? So I mean, I've been calling this thing causal, which of course it is. But uh, in, as we, you know, when we talk about the RCM and we talk about uh, the, uh, uh, the definition of causal treatment effect in economics, we said we have already defined something called the average treatment effect. So the average, remember, the average treatment effect is defined. What is the average treatment effect? When x is binary, if x is 0, 1, okay, the average treatment effect is defined in the RCM as y uh, 1 minus y 0, okay, in the RCM. Now, using the do notation, the R, the, sorry, not the R, the, the AT, right, the average treatment effect, the AT, the AT is defined using the do notation as EY given do x equal to 1 minus EY given do x equal to 0. In other words, the average treatment effect is a contrast, right? It's a contrast between what happens if do x equal to 1 and do x equal to 0. So that is the definition of average treatment effect, okay? Okay, all right. So what is the, what if x is, uh, what if x is not 0, 1? What if x is continuous variable? In that case, how do you define average treatment effect? Very simple. In that case, if x is continuous, then the average treatment effect will be this thing as a derivative of x, right? Just take the derivative of x. In the continuous version, this is what average treatment effect is. Right? Actually, I should call it like d because a, you know, that is a, a variable a function of x. So the ATE. Is, can be written as, as this. Okay. All right, now it turns out that uh, if EY given to X, 
is a function of x, right? So if this is a function of x, you are given to x, then ATE is also a function of x. In other words, ATE will change when x changes, okay? So if this is ATE, then ATE is actually a function of x, typically. And typically, it will change with respect to x. Of course, when x is 0, 1, then we have the traditional familiar formula of u i given to x1 minus 5 is a contrast of the two. Okay. All right. So as we have discussed, uh, once we, if our goal is to estimate, if our goal is to know this, we estimate e y given to x, or if our goal is to get the ATE, which is this, it's a, if, if we also have a z, if we have a z that satisfies the backdoor criteria, then it suffices that we estimate this target function, which is e y given x, right? And once we estimate this thing, then we know the causal effect we're interested in. The question is how do you estimate this from limited data, right? From the sample, from finite data, how do you estimate this? Well, you can estimate this using any statistical learning technique we have learned in the first half of the course. Uh, you can use this, you can use linear regression, you can use non-parametric regression, you can use a neural network, you can use random forest, you can use any statistical model that's, that's appropriate in order to learn UI given X. And once you have learned this, then you can compute the ATE or compute UI given to X immediately using the formula that we have talked about, okay? So that's why, you know, it's actually a two, two kind of a uh, two-stage thing. So let's see some actual, you know, simulation examples, all right? Uh, the first example is, let's, uh, let's generate some data. I'm going to have some z, so in all my simulation example today, uh, I'm going to do this. I'm going to have a z that goes to x, that causes x, and it causes y. Okay? So this is my basic setup. So z will be something that we need to control, because you know, it's a component. Alright, so z is a Z is just a, in my simulation, Z is just a normal, you know, just, just, just a normal random variable, <coughs> normally distributed. X is a Bernoulli of 1 plus uh, uh, e to the minus Z uh, to, the, to the inverse. Z. So what is, what is this, what is this thing? Mm -hmm. Very good, okay, this is just sigma function, right? Okay, so X is a Bernoulli, Bernoulli is 0, 1, right? Bernoulli, so X is a Bernoulli random variable with probability P, which is a sigma of Z, okay? Uh, all right. So x is a function of z. And also y is also a function of z. Okay? So y is 0.5z plus 2x. So the causal effect. So now, so what is the causal effect of x on y? Okay. What is the causal effect of x on y? It's very simple. It's, it's 2, right? 2 is the causal effect. Okay. All right. So that's how we generate the simulation. OK, first of all, can I, um, so here's a, here's a plot, very simple. Uh, this is z, and this is x, this is the y, this is x equal to 1, this is x equal to 0. I call x equal to 1 the treated, this is the control, right? The difference between them is the treatment effect. And the treatment effect is always 2, right? It's always 2. Question is, can I directly, can I directly run regression like this? Oh, well, can I forget about z, right? If I forget about z, can I, if I directly regress y or x, then I get biased result. Because there's a confounder z, right? Okay. It's very simple. <clears throat> uh, by the way, when I, uh, so here you guys say, I say, I say the treatment effect here is homogeneous tau equal to 2. Tau is the causal effect. By homogeneous, I mean this tau treatment effect is constant, it's not changing, and it is not varying with z. Okay? It's, it's, it's basically, like, it's, uh, it, does not, it, it does not change in the population. That's what I mean. Um, now, if, if, you, if we naively compare, EY conditional x equal to 1 versus EY conditional x equal to 0, right? So mean y x equal to 1 versus mean y equal to 0, we get 3.1, which is not the causal effect we're interested in, all right? So we cannot naively compare. We need to control for z. So let's do it. Very simple, linear regression, okay? y equal to beta 0 plus beta 1x plus beta to z. If you do that, then the, the estimated causal effect is the beta, which is 1.97. Why is beta, so this is, like, this is the fit, okay? Very, very, very simple. And this is the causal effect. Okay. So the question here is, um, why is, why is beta the causal effect? 
Why is beta? Like, why is beta the positive one? Because remember, it is not in, it is not directly right. Why is beta the at y? Because remember, what is the what is the definition of at? The definition of ATE, uh, ATE is the is what is the derivative of EY given to X taken derivative with respect to X. Okay. So why is it equal to why is it equal to beta one? Well, we know that this thing is the integral of E y given x z, right, uh, p z d z, and if you take this derivative with with respect to x, now it turns out it turns out that you can you can put this in you can you can exchange the integration with the derivative. So let's do it. Let me do the integrate outside, and let me take the derivative inside. E y given x z p z d z. Okay, All right, Everybody follows that. Right? So this is a. But what is the derivative of e y given x z with respect to what is the what is this partial derivative? If we if we have a linear model, if e y given x z is equal to beta zero plus beta one x plus beta two z. If we have a linear model, that this partial derivative is always going to give you what? Is always give, going to give you beta one, right? Okay. This partial derivative is always beta one. So we end up having what? Integrate integral beta one p z d z, which of course is always beta one. Okay. It's always beta. So, in summary, right? In summary, when we have a linear model, okay. so when we have a linear model, like, uh, well, actually, this is, not, this is not totally correct. But let me just say, um, when we have a model like this, the, 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 the partial derivative of your EY given xz with, with respect to x, which is beta 1, is, is actually your at. So there's no need to do the integration. And it's, there's no need to do the integration. You just estimate. You just estimate this equation, and the beta one is your final at. There's no need to do it in the integration. However, this is not always true, right? In many other cases, we actually need to estimate this, and we actually need to take derivative, and then we actually need to do the integral, integral, right? Now, this is true if we have this kind of thing that we you don't need to do this, just beta one. But if your model is more complicated, then you oftentimes have to do the integration. Which using, how do you do the integration? Like I said, right? how do you do integration? Just, just using something like that, right? Uh, right? Use something like that, right? You have to do this in integration in reality if your E is more complicated. OK, so what is the condition under which you have to do integration? What is the condition you don't have to do? Well, the condition is very simple. In general, if your condition expected, if your CEF, the condition expected function, is additive in is additive in x and z, meaning you can write it as p one x plus p two z. Then there is no need to do integration. Okay, why? Very, look, look at that, right? So again, this is what I just wrote. A t is equal to this raised by two x. Then you can we can put the differentiation inside the integral as a partial derivative. But if this e, if this c a function is additive in x and z. Then taking the partial derivative with respect to x give you only a function of x. So this only function x integral with respect to z is still this function x. So in other words, you just need to estimate e y given x z and then taking derivative, you will have the desired at. You don't need to do the integration with respect to z because x and z are additive. But as long as your 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 x and z are, is not additive in your e, then you have to do the integration. Okay. So I'll show you some examples later. All right. So second, right, so this here's the second example. Um, the second example is uh, again, I have a z, I have x. X is also the you know the uh, sigmoid uh, p 
uh, generated by 0, 1. So what is the difference here? The difference here is y is equal to 0 0.5z plus alpha x, but alpha is a, is a random variable. Okay? Alpha is a, is a normally distributed variable. So what is the causal effect of x on y? Well, now every x has a different causal effect on y, because alpha is different. But we can still talk about the average causal effect. We can still talk about the AT. The AT will be actually the mean of alpha. Right? OK, so it turns out in this case, Right, so this is what the data looks like. You know, this is the, this is the control group. This is the treatment group. But this treatment group, every treatment group, have a, every treatment point actually has a different kind of treatment effect. But you can still talk about the average treatment effect. And the average treatment effect is still 2. It's, it is still 2 because uh, this alpha is central around 2. Very central around 2. So what do you do in this case? Well, it's, it's pretty easy. It turns out in this case, you can still run the same exact regression. And the beta 1 will tell you the average treatment effect. Okay, because that's the you know because the beta one is the mean right is the is the, uh, is the average of the derivative of y respect to x. Okay, so the so the result is still accurate. We just do we just run it in your regression like this, right? And the difference the difference is the average treatment effect. Okay. Now, in this case, we say the treatment effect is heterogeneous because in the population, everybody has a different causal effect. However. It does not vary with z, and the average treatment we can, we can still get it up, okay? Using the basic linear regression strategy, which is this, okay? Our third example. Okay, so, so today is a bunch of examples. Now let's try this. There's a z, there's an x, but now y is z plus 2x minus 0.5x squared. So now y is a nonlinear function of the treatment, okay? So what is the causal effect? Just, just looking at this, what is the causal effect of x on y? The causal effect is 2 minus x, right? That's the causal effect. So in other words, the causal effect, the, the treatment effect of x on y changes with x. That's a non-constant treatment effect. The treatment effect changes with the value of x. Right? So it looks something like this. Now, uh, you know what I'm plotting. So I'm plotting x here, and a y here. Okay. So and then, and then, you know z equal to zero, z equal to one. Um, so in this case, what do you do? It's very easy, right? We just need to control for z, and we just do a polynomial in x, right? Same thing, okay? Right. Control for z, and then just 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 put the correct functional form into uh, this regression, and we are done. Okay, so the first the first element of so beta one estimates two, beta two estimate is point negative point five, we get the correct estimate, right? And once we get the correct estimate, okay, so it looks like this because it's a polynomial in X, uh, with a, with a slight difference due to Z. <clears throat> and uh, right, so in this case, um, the treatment effect is homogeneous because it doesn't it doesn't change from person to person. It's you know, everybody has the same. Treatment effect, but it's non-constant in x, meaning it changes with x. And the at is 2 minus x. So, you know, so once based on our estimation results, uh, we have the treatment effect, which is 2. It is, uh, so when, you know, when x equal to 0, it is 2. But then it goes up here and it goes down here. Right? So these are estimate or estimate treatment effect. It's non-constant in x. Now let's take a look at a different kind of example. Now, our x has the same causal effect on y, which is 2, the constant causal effect. No longer, right, no longer vary with x. But the z is not a z. It's a sine z, right? So y is a function of sine z, which is a you know, nonlinear shape of z, plus the 2x. Okay. It looks like this. Where this is our z, this is our x, this is the treatment. Oh, sorry, this is the control, this is the treatment. The difference is always two because that's the constant treatment effect. But it is a nonlinear function of z. How do we get it? How do we get the? How do we get it? Can I can I use a linear question here? Can I say y equal to beta? So, so the idea is you don't know you don't know right you don't know y is a function of sine z. You have no idea. So can I do a linear question? Y equal to beta zero plus beta y x plus beta two z. No, the result would be very bad. It's because here your functional form is misspecified, right? 
So here's the so the idea here is look, you know you need to control for z. So you know that what you need. So you know that y given x, you know that you know this is what you need. Okay, uh, you know you, you know need, you need to control for z. However, you use a linear regression, you use a linear model to approximate this one when it is not a linear model. So in this case, your your statistical model, right? Remember. Again, causal inferencing in the reduced form where it has two stages. The first stage is causal reasoning, right, or identification, causal identification. The second stage is statistical modeling. So here what I'm saying is the first stage you do it perfect. Okay? You are perfect in the first stage. You know Z is the confounder. You know you need to control for Z. So this step you do it perfect. But the second step you're not doing it right. Because you're not picking the right statistical model to approximate this thing. You are picking a linear model when in reality it's not a linear model. So let's take a look at the, the actual result, right? The result is very, well, it's not very good. The result is x equal to, treatment is x equal to 2.5, when in reality it is 2, okay? So we have a pretty sizable bias here in our treatment by estimation. Okay? So this, what I want to show in this example is you can, you can, use the, you can control for the correct variable, but if you're functional form, if your statistical model is not good enough, then you still have a pretty sizable bias in your estimation of causal effect. Right? That's the importance of choosing. Right? This is what it looks like. If you use a linear model to fit an obviously nonlinear kind of thing, uh, then you get bias. Okay? Right? This is your estimated treatment effect. When in reality, it should be, it should be here, right? It should be smaller. This is 2.5, it should be 2. Okay? You are, you're getting a lot of bias. Okay, so what can you do? What can you do? Well, again, I assume that you don't know it's you don't know the underlying true function, right? You don't know it's sine z, okay? You have no idea it's sine z. Well, you can. What we can do first is we can try to use a semi-parametric model. So the idea of semi-parametric model is it's y equal to beta zero plus beta one x. So this is parametric, but I'm going to use a very non-parametric method here, gz. So GZ, in particular, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a smoothing spline. Remember, we talked about smoothing spline? Smoothing spline is any kind of function, right? But then we penalize it, regularize it, by minimizing the second derivative of the function, so that produces a smooth spline approximation to the function form. So the smoothing spline is kind of a non-parametric method, where we can approximate any function form that is. And so I, I don't know it's sine Z, but I use a smoothing spline or is, is, is something like a semi parametric method to estimate uh, this thing, okay? So in practice in R, what you can do, we use a library called MGCV, which has this GM function that allows us to do this, okay? Allow us to estimate a function y, x plus sz, where sz is a flexible function that we approximate using a smoothing spline. Right. And, uh, and here's the result, once we do that, we get the correct causal effect. Okay. We get the correct treatment effect where the treatment effect is two. Right. So we get it out. Okay. Um, and this is our fit. Okay. Right. So you can see the fit is very good. Right. We're able to, even though we don't know it's a sign, we're able to approximate the sign function very well, and we get the correct treatment effect out. Okay. Right. So the so the lesson here is what you know the what the lesson here is. Um, it is important to get both steps correct, not just the first step, where, where you, you think about what variable do I need to control, but also the second step, which is once you have determined what variable you want to control, you have to, we have to choose a good statistical model to model the, the expectation, to model the ECF, okay, the, uh, the conditional expectation function, CEF. Okay? So that's the that's important. Step. Now, uh, let's look at another example. Right? So, uh, so in this example, what I'm doing is I'm generating x, y, to z such that it looks like this. Okay. So, so first of all, it's, an, it's the y is a function of z and x is obviously not a linear function z. Here's it, right? a function not linear z. But also, in our previous example, but in this example, um, y is not a linear function of z, but the treatment effect is is the same everywhere. The treatment effect is two, constant, right? Constant treatment effect. Here, in this example, the treatment effect is no longer two everywhere. Actually, the treatment effect changes with respect to z. Different z give you different treatment effect. In this case, we say it is a 
is not a homogeneous treatment fat. It is a heterogeneous treatment fat, meaning the treatment fat is different in the population. People who have different Z have different treatment fat. Okay, so it's the, not the same treatment fat everywhere in the population. It's actually different depending on Z. So it's a heterogeneous treatment fat. All right, how how do we do that? Right? How do we um, how do we estimate uh, this thing? Now, uh, it turns out, okay, uh, first of all, what is the true treatment effect? The true treatment effect in terms of uh, uh, the true AT, okay? The true ATE where, uh, you know, essentially is E, Y given to X equal to one, because we here X is binary. So minus E, Y, given do x equal to 0. So what is this true AT? Well, according to our true model here, the true AT is 1.87. That's the true AT. How do I compute that? I take, I take all the difference, right? There's all, the, all these difference, AT, all the different treatment fat, and I essentially integrate them with, with respect to the distribution of Z. If you do that, so you, just average, you, can think about them, you can think about this as average, okay? I just average all these different treatment effects. And the result, the, the total right, the, the total treatment effect is 1.87. That's our true value, okay? Almost like true value. How do you estimate this? Well, there are different ways to estimate it. The first way to the first way to estimate this is I say, okay, I have a y as a function of x as a function of z. But also, um, also I can do what I can do is I can have the z interact with x, because the because here the treatment effect obviously depends on z, right? Okay, so that's the idea. So I can I can have a y regress on x, regress on z, but I can also regress on x z because you know if this is the treatment effect actually on y. This thing does not vary with z. But here, the treatment effect varies with z. So I can add something like an interaction effect, okay? interaction term, to capture that kind of interaction. But there's another way. Because we only have x, x equal to 0 and x equal to 1. Right? We only have these two values for x. I can, I, can, I can estimate the separate regression function for each value. So let me do one regression, which is y on z only, no x. But y on z only as this regression, but only confined to x equal to zero. Meaning, I'm going to fit a, I'm going to fit a regression of y on z for only for x equal to zero, and then only for x equal to one, I'm going to fit another line. And the difference between them is our treatment effect. Okay, people understand? I can, I can fit a flexible, I can fit a flexible function here. I can fit a flexible function here for one for x equal to zero, the other for x equal to one, and then both as a function of z, and then the difference between them has to be the treatment effect. So essentially what I'm doing is, let's fit a line here, and let's fit a line here, right? The difference is the treatment effect, okay? Um, so, all right? So if we do this, when we estimate this, what do we get? If I estimate y as a function of z only for x equal to 0, so only look at x equal to 0, and I fit this, what I get is e y conditional on what? Conditional on x equal to 0 and z, right? This is what do I get. If I estimate this equation for x equal to 1, I get e y conditional x equal to 1 z. Okay? So based on these two, what is the AT estimate? How do we estimate the AT? What is the AT here? The ATE will be equal to, um, remember the AT is integrate, integral with respect to z. So integral in finite sample, we can use Monte Carlo integration. So again, AT1, 1 of n, summation, I equal to 1 to n, okay? And then what 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 uh, what? What is that? Well, I can say E 
E y conditional on x equal to 1, but z equal to z i, okay? z equal to this i. And this is my estimate from this one, right? So estimate this regression, give me this estimate, this estimate. So I have this one. Minus e hat y conditional x equal to 0, z equal to z i. Okay, do people see that? So that is the difference. And because I, I can estimate this using my first regression, I do this using my second regression, I monitor this, calculate on my finite sample, do the integration, that give me the AT. So that's my strategy. So this is what I'm going to do, right? I'm going to estimate, I just estimate, I'm going to fit the, fit, you know, so, so this is what I'm doing. I'm going to estimate this equation for x equal to zero. I'm going to estimate this equation for x equal to one. And I'm going to do this, okay, to calculate the AT. The result is not very good. Because for x equal to 1, I estimate the linear line. For x equal to 0, I estimate the linear line. And then I use the strategy to calculate, and then I average, and I average all the estimated treatment effects. The result is pretty bad. The result is, uh, okay, it's pretty bad. So the problem here is I'm using a linear line to estimate these nonlinear functions. So in order to improve my estimate, I'm going to again do the spline, right? So I'm going to say y is a smoothing spline of z for x equal to 0, and y is a different smoothing spline of z for x equal to 1. So for x equal to 0, for x equal to 0, x equal to 1, I'm going to estimate a separate, very flexible function. And then I take the difference as the treatment effect, and then I average them to give you the AT, right? Okay. So uh, the way to do it is I fit y as a function of sz confined only to the x equal to 0 subpopulation. Or I also do the same confined to the subset of x equal to 1. And then I, you know, and I take, the, take the difference between them. So the result, so once I do this, the result is 1.87, which is almost exactly the true AT. Okay? Remember, the true AT is 1.87. So right now we get something very close to the truity, okay, 1.877. In this case, right, this is my fit, this is my fit, and so the estimated causal effect at every z is correct, and then if you average them, it gives you the final AT. Right? <coughs> okay, so this is all correct, okay? Large causal effect here, small causal effect here, large causal effect here, large causal effect, average them, the final AT. Now let's Let's get something even more fancy, right? Um, so now, uh, this is going to be my z. Uh, this is going to be my x. x is caused by z. So now, so previous, in all the other previous examples, our x is binary, 0, 1. The 0, 1 treatment. <laughs> now I'm going to have a continuous treatment, OK? x is continuous, and y is a continuous, y is this, y is this, OK? Whatever it is, OK? So y is this continuous function of x and z. So z is our confounder. Z is a still confounder because z causes what? Z causes x, and x z causes y. Okay. All right. Uh, by the way, if you if you if you see here in all my in all this setup, I'm writing this I'm writing this arrow instead of the equate instead instead of the equate, because the arrow to, because I prefer to use the arrow to represent structural equation. By structural equation, I mean this variable cause this variable. So z cause x. And x z calls y. Okay, all right. So x is the treatment, and we have this very complicated relationship. Now, uh, if you if you want to know how to simulate this, you can look at the coding. But this is the result. So this is the z variable. This is the x variable. This is the y variable, and it's a pretty complicated relation. Right? All right. How do you, how do we do this? Well, first of all, how do we calculate the ATE? Right? What is the ATE? Well, the AT is like we said. The AT is the is the is the integral integral with respect to a partial derivative with respect to x. So now, remember, right? The um, in the previous case when x is, is zero and one, the AT is simply the uh, condition x equal to one minus condition x equal to zero. Here, x is continuous, so the AT is basically a derivative, but it also changes with x. So so in this case, our causal effect is a function of x, right? So you know, it's non constant x. And the way we do it is taking the derivative of ey given xz uh, with respect to x, 
and then an average on the available data, on the observed data. So this is like the integration. So that gave us the, the final AT. Okay? So this is one way to do it, of course. The other way to do it is to, is to first calculate the entire thing. So integrate y given xz on the training data, on the observed data, to get the integral. And then take derivative of this thing with by 2x. You can do both, OK? This one, this one, they're equivalent. Just the, just, the, just the order of the differentiation. So in this case, um, the treatment effect is both heterogeneous. Uh, and it has it's different in the population <coughs> Z and also non constant X. Alright. Uh, okay. So this is this is my calculated the true AT. So this is the true value based on the functional form. The way I calculate this true AT is essentially doing doing this. Okay? So once you follow these steps and calculate the uh, the derivative of uh, Y, you know, given X Z with special X, it, you get this one. Okay? So you get this AT. This AT is a function of X. When X changes everywhere, it, you know, it, it, value, it, it varies with X. That's the AT. So now our goal is to try to estimate this. Right? It's no longer a constant. It's a change in causal effect and a change in with X. Okay. How do we get this out? That's the question. Well, let's first try. Okay, so the, the, the first way we try Remember, in, you know, even in this case, it looks very complicated, right? Even this very complicated case, we know that we know that the basic causal structure is still z goes to x and z goes to y. This is still the same. We still have the same causal graph for this one, right? It's just it's just the functional form is very complicated. Okay. So because this is still the causal graph, we know that all we need to do is to estimate e y. If we can estimate this thing correctly, then we are done. Because from this, from once we can estimate this, then I can calculate the AT using the formula I just gave. Okay? Just taking a derivative and integrate, etc. Et but this is the key. How do you get this? How do you get this? Well, we know that Y is this very complicated function of XZ. So in reality, how do you estimate EY given XZ? First of all, you cannot use a linear regression. Okay? You cannot say this is equal to beta 0 plus beta 1 x plus beta 2 z. If you use a linear model, you will get nowhere because this is obviously nonlinear, very complicated. So, what do we do? Well, we have tried spline, right? You know, in one, you know, in one x, we have tried spline. So, let's try spline, spline again. So, let's do a spline fit of y as a function of x z. Now, if now this is called, so the, 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 exactly what I'm trying here is called thin place spline, which is a kind of spline in multi-dimension. But you don't have to know the detail, right? But just think about the thin place spline as very similar to a smoothing spline in one dimension. Okay? So it's a multi-dimensional spline where it allows you to, to flexibly model the relation between x, z, and y. So let's try it, okay? Let's do the thin place spline and then use the fit to calculate the AT. You can you can look at the code yourself. I'm going. I'm not going to explain exactly uh, every step, but this is the fit. Okay, this is the spline fit. Now x, z, and y, and then we have this estimated surface of you know the relation of y is a function of x, z, and from this surface we can calculate the at. Okay, the at which is the which is essentially the derivative of y with respect to x integrate over z. That's the at. Okay, so this is our at. This is the true. This is the true AT. This is our estimated AT by thin place plan. Okay, it's a TPS. Uh, is it good? Is the fit good? It looks pretty good, right? You know, at least you know you can never do this with a linear model, obviously. Okay, so if, it, if it's able to give you a, a shape that's pretty close to the true AT, now the question is, can we improve upon it? Maybe there's a way to do better. Remember, in the first half of the course, we, we talk about many, well, not many, we don't really have too much time, but at least I, I mentioned the many statistical models. <laughs> so what, do I, what did I mention in the first half? I mentioned, uh, you know, I mentioned the spline, I mentioned the spline thing, okay? Smoothing spline already mentioned. Uh, I mentioned the uh, tree-based methods, random forest. I mentioned support of vector machine, but I haven't talked about it. Also mentioned neural network, but I haven't talked about it, right? So 
let's try, all right? Let's try if we can use some other statistical methods, machine learning methods, to try to get the correct shape even better than a spline, right? Let's try. So the way I do it is I'm going to create a training data set and, and training and a test set, just like we are very familiar with, okay? I take my XYZ data, Splitting, splitting to training and the validation sets, actually, not test sets, but validation sets. And I'm going to use the validation sets to help me pick the best model, okay? So I try, so the first thing I do is I try, again, I try the thin place spine. But this time, I fit the thin place spine only on the training data. And I'm going to use the fit to predict on um, the validation data, or the test data. And this is my prediction, okay? So, this, so my error term is 0 0.079. That's my prediction error, okay? Let's see if we can do better than this. So the second thing I'm going to do is support a vector machine, SVM. Now, now in this lecture, in my lecture, in my lecture slides, I only, I only show you the thin place plan and support a vector machine. But in reality, I've also tried a random forest, okay? And the random forest is not performing as well as, as these two. But you can, try all, you can try every method you want, right? So let's try support a vector machine. Again, we haven't studied that in our course. So you, have, you just have to trust me, okay? So what I'm doing is a, is a method called support, support a vector machine. And when support a vector machine is used for regression, uh, so that support a vector machine uh, is, tip, is most often used for uh, classification, in which case it's called SVM. When we use support a vector machine for regression purposes, it's, also, it's often called SVR, support a vector regression, whatever, okay? So we're doing the SVM uh, of Y on the, on the data, on the training data, and I do, a, I do a bunch of tuning because, you know, as all these machine learning methods, you require a lot of tuning of hyperparameters. So once you do a lot of tuning, you find the best SVM. Um, let's see how well it performs on the test data. And the error term is now 0 0.045. So remember, right, the thin place line is 0 0.079. The SVM gave me 0 0.045. So the SVM in this case outperforms the thin place line. Okay, so the SVM is a better method, you know, for this case, right, for this training data. So let's use SVM and see if we can get a better quality right now. Right? So, we're going to do the, so the best model is the SVM, and we're going to use SVM to fit the data, and then I'm going to I'm going to use the fit to calculate the AT. Here's the result. Okay. Here's the result. This is the true again. This is the true AT, and this is estimated AT by the SVM. You can see that here, the ST, using the STV, SVM, we get a better approximation of the underlying average treatment. Okay? Now, so even if, even if the, the, you know, the thin place plan looks already very good, we're able to improve upon it using what? By picking the best model, by picking the best statistical model to fit our data, using machine learning algorithm that we're already familiar with, or at least we pretend we're familiar with from the first half of this course. Right? All right. Uh, oh, by the way, if you are, you know, how do you do standard? How do you do standard error? Because once you get, once we fit the AT, you know, in practice, we also want to have the standard error, right? We want to do, uh, we want the inference. We want to know whether whether each AT is significant, right? Statistically significant, because uh, this these these mod, these errors looks like very significant, but for this for this AT that's around zero, we want to know whether they're actually statistically significant from zero. So the way to do it, you can, all, we can, you can always do bootstrap. Even if you don't have an exact formula to calculate the asymptotic error, you can always do bootstrap, right? Just, just, just bootstrap many samples, many, many, um, uh, many samples from the training data, and then apply the same procedure, and then you can estimate the standard error of your procedure. So this is the result. Now it's not very clear, but it should be clear if you look at the slides. Not very clear from the screen. But these are this is the com this is the ninety five percent confidence interval, and from this ninety five confidence confidence interval, you can you can basically declare some effect to be uh, significant and some effect to be un you know, insignificant, okay? Just from by calculating the confidence interval, all right? Okay. All right. Um, <clears throat> so uh, so that's that's all our you know that's all the simulation on the show today. Uh, some final remark, okay? Some final discussion. First of all, this is a point that uh, somebody has already asked me uh, several classes before, which is this. Um, suppose we have this causal model of z go to x, z1 goes to y, and there's z2 that causes y. Um, 
based on the Bechdel criteria, we know that the minimum sufficient set is Z1. So we absolutely, absolutely need to control for Z1. But do we also control for Z2 uh, in our regression? Well, right, because controlling for Z2 also satisfies the Bechdel criteria. So the question is, do you want to control for Z2? Well, the answer is, in many cases, yes, because controlling also, if you also control for Z2, just add Z2 to your regression, your regression do become more precise. Okay, so, right. Now, uh, here, so here's the, here's, the, here's the idea. I mean, the basic way to understand this, okay, is that let's take a look at this diversion. E y given to x. Suppose we're talking about the underlying population. Okay? In the underlying population, E y given to x is equivalent, it can be equivalently expressed as these two ways. The first way is E y given x z1 and integrate with, with respect to z1. Because we know that controlling for z1 give you the, you know, is, is enough, okay? So we can write it this way. Now the second way is we know controlling for z1 and we can also control for z2. So it can also be written as the EY conditional on X, Z1, Z2, and integrate with respect to both Z1 and Z2. In theory, if we have the entire population data, then these two are exactly the same. They should give you exactly the same causal effect. All right? So, so the answer is, if you have infinite data, it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter whether you control for Z1 or Z1, Z2. It should give you exactly the same answer. However, in practice, we don't have infinite data. We only have a finite sample. And in finite sample, these two are actually different. And they're different for two reasons. The first reason is, is really, you know, is really which one helps you if you have EY given Z1, X, the other is EY given X, Z1, Z2. Now, the first way they're different is that these two have a different precision. Essentially, these one, these two can have these, uh, these two can be different models. So one model can can be helped to predict y better than the other model, right? So no, suppose okay, suppose this model is beta zero plus beta one x plus beta two z one. This is beta zero plus beta one x plus beta one, beta two z one plus beta three z two. All right? Okay, which one is better? As a as a model for y, as a model for you know, as a model for y, which one is better? Is this one better as a model for y? Is this one as a model for y? Well, it doesn't. You don't know. The answer is you don't know. This is the class. This is basically the model selection problem we talk about, right? Remember, when we add more variables, the model become more complicated. Is 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 more complicated model always the better? No, right? It could initially it could be better, but then it could be worse. Right, so this is all the model selection we have talked about using AIC, BIC, using forward stepwise algorithm, right? Or using lasso, whatever you want to use, right? So all these, all these, all these variable selection method, forward stepwise, AIC, you know, forward stepwise, lasso, etc., etc. All these methods are basically helps helps you to figure out what is the best statistical model to be used to model one. Now it turns out that more the best model to predict Y will be the best model to use. To uh, you know, to decide. So right. So it turns out that which one is better? Is this one better? Is this one better? Or is this one better? Depends on the familiar bias varies trade-off in picking the best statistical model. Okay. Maybe this one has a better. Maybe this one is better. Depends on which model has the optimal complexity to model one. Now, in this case, in in many cases, in reality, in practice, in many cases, in economics. Um, Sometimes our model may not be complicated enough. Okay, it's not over. So if so, if z one is already high dimensional, you probably don't want to add another z two, right? But if z one just one variable, and uh, and then the model is probably not complicated enough, right? So it's not it's underfitting. You are underfitting, not overfitting. Then in that case, adding z two probably helps, so that the model is more precise, in, this way, in that sense. Okay, so that's the first trade off here. The second trade off is this. Even if this model is better, okay, even if adding Z2 helps better predict Y, which will make this one better in finite sample. 
Should we always do that? Again, no. Why? Because even if this is better than this, we still have to do integration. And in this setup, in this setup, we only need to integrate with respect to z1. In this setup, we, we need to integrate with respect to both z1 and z2. In other words, the dimension of integration become larger. Now, how do we do integration in, in practice? Remember, we do integration by, by doing what? We do integration in practice by doing a bunch of color things, right? So integrate, integrate, uh, so ex, so integrate x with respect to px, dx is equal to 1 over n summation i xi. That's how we do integration. Now, this integration, this Monte Carlo method is not precise. It's not precise, but right? it's not exact. So, the, the error in this Monte Carlo integration depends on what? Depends on how many data we have. If our n is very large, then this is very precise, right? If n is small, then this is not as precise. But it also depends on the dimension of x. If the more that, right, the more we do, so suppose we integrate with respect to xz, okay? So that we have px and the pz dx dz. So if we're doing a two-dimensional integration, then what we're doing is, is xi and zi here. But then in this case, once the dimension become larger, this integral become worse. The Monte Carlo, the Monte Carlo integration become a worse approximation to this. In other words, when we're doing integration, there's also a curse of dimensionality. The higher the dimension, the worse the performance of this Monte Carlo integration. Right? So, again, here, right, even if this is better than this, because we are integrating with, with respect to a higher dimension, then the result of this whole thing may be worse than this. Okay? So these are the basic two trade-offs. The first trade-off is which one is a better model of what? The second trade-off is the dimension of integration. The higher the dimension, the worse the performance of the final one. With only one exception. The only one exception is if we are interested in the ATE and we use an additive model where y is a function of a function of x plus a function of z, and then there's no interaction. Remember, when, when there's an additive model, what happens? What happens is we don't need to do the integration. The derivative of this thing with, with respect to x is the derivative of this thing with respect to x. No need to do the integration. In that case, we no longer have this trade-off. Okay. okay, all right, summary, in summary. What does it mean in practice, right? In practice, this means, you know, in, um, in many empirical economic applications, when you do regression, you always have this question about how many variables do I need to control, right? Now, do I need to control everything? Do I need to control only for the, the, the minimum sufficient uh, set of variables that I control for confounding, or do I need to throw in everything? The answer here is two things. Number one, um, the, uh, uh, the more you throw in, Okay? The more complicated your linear model, so suppose you're using, well, let me, suppose you're not using linear model, just let me say, the more variable you control for, the more complicated your model becomes. And so there is an optimal degree of complexity. Okay? So that's the familiar variable selection problem we are facing. So in other words, the first answer is it's not always the better to control for more variable because you face this, this, this complexity trade, you face this bias variance trade off. Now, if this, is not a, this may not be a concern, if you are, you are thinking about, should I control for 10 variables or 20 variables? It becomes a concern if you're thinking about, should I control for 50 variables or 100 variables when, when data is very small, okay? Or maybe I control for 1,000 variables, nobody do that in the right? But it will be a concern if you have many, many variables you have already controlled for. So that's the first thing. Second thing is, um, if you are using a linear model, it's beta one, you know, beta zero plus beta one x plus beta two z. There's no interaction, and there's no interaction between x and z. In that case, you don't need to worry about integration. There's no such concern. So if you're using a linear model and uh, your model is not overfitting, then yes, typically adding more z, adding more control will help you to get a better, more precise result. Okay, so that's the, so the, so the answer to what happens in the application. The only thing that you need to be wary about or, or cautious about is that there are some variables you should not control for. Never, because if this is x and this is y, uh, and there is a z1 goes to x, z2 uh, goes to x and it goes to y, and the z3 goes to goes to y. Now, can you control for 
Can you control for uh, Z2? Yes, you have to control for Z2. Um, can you control for Z1? There's no need. If you add Z1 to it, no help. If you control for Z3, yes, it also may help, right? If you control for Z3, it can make your Y a better model. Okay? Possibly. Now, and in that case, if you use a linear model, you don't need to worry about integration to get your ATE. So, adding Z3 often helps. But can you, can you control for Z4? Never, right? Never control for Z4. Because Z4 is a collider, it's the consequence of it. It's a collider you should never control for. So in reality, you know, you need to be careful. Uh, you still need to be careful about what variables you throw in. Never control for something like a Z4, which is a collider that, uh, that you know, that's what you control for. It open the correlation between X and Y. Okay? So that's our first discussion. Uh, the final, the second final discussion I want to have, so I'm skipping all the simulations, you can take a look at yourself. Um, but, the, but the final is really a comment, okay? The final is really a comment. Uh, the comment is this. Um, right now in economics, um, actually how many... Alright, so the comment is this. I hope today, right, the final lecture, but after what I've shown you is uh, getting, if, if we want, the, want, want to get the best ATE estimate, it's important that the both, both steps in, in reduced form causal inference is important. The first step is deciding what variable to control, okay? What is the variable that I need to control for? How do I design my strategy? So this is the identification. So identification is very important. We need to know what variable to control for. And the identification stage, or the causal reasoning stage, is a stage that traditionally very emphasized by econometrics. So traditionally, when you do econometrics, a lot of effort is spent on thinking about identification. Okay, so should I, should I, should I control for this variable? Should I use an IV? Should I, uh, should I use a panel data where there's a fixed effect? Should I use a quasi-experimental method? Right? What do I do in order to get the confounding out, right? right? Get rid of the confounding and identify the causal effect. So this step is traditionally very emphasized in econometrics. But the second step is almost never emphasized in traditional econometrics, which is once we establish identification, we know what our strategy is. What is the best statistical model, right? What is the best statistical model? Now, traditionally in econometrics, once you figure out what variables do I want to control, what variable do I want to use as an IV, right, to identify the causal effect? I just use a linear model. Linear model. I just use a linear model, do some linear regression, plus some IV or, you know, whatever, right, to so, some controls, and that's it, and I get my causal effect. So the second step is traditionally very not emphasized. You just everybody just do linear, right? However, I hope to show, right, through my lecture today, I hope to show that this is, the second step is as important as the first step. Because if you don't use the best statistical model, the AT you get is often extremely wrong, even if you have controlled for the correct variables. Okay, so even if you have used the correct strategies, you have done your identity argument correctly, if you don't use the best system model, you are, you know, it's not going to work. Okay, it's not going to work. So that's the final comment uh, I want to make today. Okay? All right. Um, that's it. That's all I want to talk about uh, uh, in this lecture. We don't have, I wish we had more time, but we don't have more time. So there's still a very limited discussion about econometrics, uh, but you know, hopefully uh, the course is of some help. So whatever, so what is left? Uh, homework for the final. So we're not going to have, so we're not going to have homework for today's lecture, right? Um, but we're going to have homework for foundation, which is I've already extended the deadline to the track it, and uh, and then we're going to have a final project. And if you're not sure about your final project, like you know. Can I submit this? Can I submit that? Uh, talk to me before you do that, right? Uh, especially if you intend to use something you have already written for some other courses, and you're not sure you know, how, how, how well I will react to that, right? So let me know, talk to me before. Uh, I'm more lenient than you may think. Um, and that's it, okay? And also give me your final, so if you're interested in designing question for the final exam, send it to me before next month, okay? All right, so that's it, let's, uh, let's call it a day. Okay.